Today's Thursday, June 11, 2020. Coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, the Congressional Black Caucus held a form of police accountability today. We'll show you some of the testimony and talk about the issue with Black Lives Matter co-founder Alicia Garza. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is calling for the removal of Confederate statues from, US, from the U.S. Capitol. They're coming down a number of southern states. Also, what about those Christopher Columbus statues? The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff apologizes, saying he should not have taken part in a photo op with Donald Trump at a church near the White House. Also, a state senator in Ohio says a good reason why black people are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 because the colored people aren't washing their hands. And Kentucky Senator, state senator, uh, sorry, Kentucky Representative Charles Booker, who's running for the United States Senate, is here to talk about his campaign. I'll also talk to Clark Peters about the new film from Spike Lee on Netflix, The Five Bloods. And of course, another crazy-ass white woman. Time to bring the funk of Roland Martin Unfiltered. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. All right, folks, the Congressional Black Caucus held a hearing this morning about police accountability and reimagining how policing is done. The speakers included civil rights activists, politicians, and thought leaders. Here is Congresswoman Terry Sewell of Alabama. We have to transform our police. We're hearing that clearly from the voices of those in the streets and from the voices and other panelists that we hear today. But we also know that power concedes nothing without a demand never has, never will. It did so when Frederick Douglass echoed those words in 1850, and we in the African-American community have seen it time and time again. Our demand has often been through protest. I represent Alabama's 7th Congressional District. It took the 13 months of, of boycott in Montgomery, Alabama, before we got uh, civil uh, the Supreme Court rule um, desegregation of public transportation. It took 600 protesters being bradgered on a bridge in my hometown of Selma, Alabama. John Lewis, our colleague, on the front lines of that beating before we got the Civil Rights, uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Of course, it took the bombing and four little girls losing their lives before we got the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The riots of 68 before we got the Fair Housing Act of 1968. We are in another inflection point, and we owe it to the righteous indignation of young people on the streets, 16, I guess today is 17 days of protests. And I'm proud that the Congressional Black Caucus is leading that effort with the Policing and Justice Act of 2020. But it's just a bill until we get it passed and signed into law. We still have much work to be done. One of the folks who testified today is Alicia Garza. She is the co-founder of Black Lives Matter, and she joins us right now. Alicia, how you doing? I'm hanging in there, Roland. How are you? All right, I love your setup. <laughs> Thank you for helping me with it. <laughs> glad to have you. Glad to have you. All right. So, so first off, um, the I've been saying this, and I keep repeating this, that this is a tipping point. That's that right. what has taken place in the aftermath of the death of George Floyd has led to a true reckoning in this country, and I believe that there is no greater moment for Black folks to make maximum demands in every sector of this country, whether it's public policy and corporate, than where we are right now. That's right. 
That's right. I mean, here's the thing, Roland. You know, it is a tipping point in this country. Culturally, everything is changing. I can't turn on the television today without seeing Black Lives Matter. I, you know, turned on television last night, late at night after I was trying to finish up my testimony. And, you know, I was watching reality shows, right? Grappling with the existence and the legacy of racism. And yet we now have an opportunity to translate culture into policy. And that leap is actually a big leap. I can say honestly that it's so important that legislation is being introduced right now to really address not only what's happening with policing in this country, but also to address the systemic disinvestment in Black communities that allows policing to bridge the gaps in the infrastructure that has been intentionally destroyed. And while it's true that there is a lot of alignment uh, particularly at the CBC, about making sure that we invest in infrastructure, I am concerned that we are not going far enough. I think it's important that part of this legislation is talking about oversight and accountability. And again, we have to not only, as uh, Representative Sewell said, make the bill into law, but we also have to take into account that you know this bill gives money for law enforcement uh, uh, to, you know, administer grants and do more oversight and accountability. And it's under Attorney General Barr's Department of Justice. And so if anybody ever thought or would say to you that elections don't matter, I think we have to be very, very clear that elections do matter. And this election is incredibly important. Well, it is yeah. already going to be an uphill battle for this bill to pass, uh, not only through the House, but frankly, it's going to be almost impossible to move it through the Senate, well, given yeah. the strength of the police lobby, but also given uh, the, the fear, I think, of really addressing some of the core issues that are at stake in terms of how policing is used in our communities. Well, yeah, folks, look, look Congressman Jim Clyburn, highest-ranking African-American in the House, uh, he gave an interview where he said he absolutely against defunding the police. I commented on social media, but Kari Sellers commented by saying, look, you're getting this wrong. And I think, what's ha I think part of the problem is that some Democrats are falling into this whole deal that when they hear defund the police, that means get rid of the police. I haven't heard anybody say, well, no, there are some people I've said who said get rid of the police, but the reality is you can't. You can't. <laughs> now, when you say defund, I've heard Senator Kamala Harris talk, talk about this here. I've heard others who say, no, it's about how you shift resources, how you deal with mental illness, how you deal with uh, uh, teaching people to de-escalate. So, so the part of the problem, I think, is also folks who automatically go, oh, no, my God. And then I keep hearing, change the phrase, change the phrase. I keep going, what the hell are you going to change it to? Because the people, right. the people who <laughs> criticize it are going to criticize that. That's right. That's right. And listen, I mean, nobody was saying change the phrase when folks were talking about defunding Planned Parenthood, right? We're actually clear about what it means. And when it comes from the other side, what they actually mean is we want to weaken the power of something. And on our side, what we're saying is not only do we want to weaken the stranglehold, right, of the police lobby on our communities, but we also have to have the corresponding investment in our communities. It is clear, Roland, that ever since 1965 in this country, we have task forced, we have uh, blue ribbon commissioned, we have passed a number of reforms that frankly um, are not making an impact. And that has a lot to do with the way in which the police lobby um, uses its power and influence and its resources that we continue to give it to spin and provide scare tactics away from accountability and actually towards less and less oversight, less and less transparency, and less and less accountability for those organizations. Here's what's real. Nobody can be above the law, and police have to be included in that. That is fact. Here's what's also real. Because our opposition understands how successful this movement is, because they understand that the tide is turning in this country, they are working into overtime, trying to scare any ally from pulling back the curtains and saying, 
None of this is keeping us safe. And they're using old scare tactics from 2016 and frankly from 2013. What I said in front of in front of the Congressional Black Caucus this morning was that we can't message test our way out of this. And frankly, we've been hearing change the slogan since we started Black Lives Matter in 2013. Lots of people wanted us to change it to All Lives Matter because they thought it was going to make people feel more comfortable with it. But thank God we didn't do that. We right. said what we said and we said what we meant. And we have to be able to have the courage in this moment to say what we mean. What we are saying here is that there is undue influence and power that the police lobbies have on our communities, which are frankly keeping us from solving problems that are good for all of us. We cannot continue to lay this at the feet of law enforcement and expect that they are equipped to deal with it. But on the other hand, we cannot continue to shirk responsibility for addressing the ways in which our budgets are constructed. If we believe that budgets are moral documents, the way that our morals are being presented right now is 100% shameful, especially in the wake of the murders of people like George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, and so many others who never actually make the news. If we want to curb violence in our communities, we have to actually invest in where the gaps are. And that is what is important for us to understand right now. And bring, we cannot be scared to do it. I'll bring my panel right now. I'm Dr. Greg Carr, Chair of the Department of African American Studies, Howard University, Reese Colbert, Black Women's Views, Erica Savage Wilson, host Savage Politics Podcast, uh, to this conversation with Alicia. Greg, look, this is no time for scared Negroes. <laughs> I, I, I was on the phone, and I, I, folks have been calling me. I, I've had people who are entertainment, who are artists, who've been calling and saying, man, you know what? We've got these white jazz artists who said nothing, but they got all black bands. My response was, I need you to get with your fellow black jazz artists and call their asses out. I had somebody <laughs> who was on the phone who was saying uh, in media, uh, I said, look, I said, I'm vice president, digital for National Association of Black Journalists, but we're going to need these black people within these media companies at CNN, at ABC, at NBC, at CBS to actually say something themselves. Look mm -hmm. what just happened with, uh, with Adidas. Black employees at Adidas spoke up. The next day, Adidas said, we better spend $100 million for organizations and one-third of all uh, future employees are going to be black and Latinx. Okay? And so, so all of a sudden, so this moment with police reform, folks are going to have to stand up and not try to, well... They might not like this or like that. Damn that. Force them to say no. That's what, Greg, I think Alicia's also saying. No, I agree. And much respect to Sister Garza and, and those who continue in this new reconstruction moment. Uh, just like the fact that we're in a pandemic and this crisis of the pandemic has revealed the structural failures of this society, this moment is revealing the character of everyone in it. I'm sure all our texts and, and emails and phones have been blowing up with folks wanting to make confession and explain their inactivity or consult to move forward. And in social movements, we know that that first general strike against the social order is spontaneous. I mean, it comes out of a flashpoint moment, like the deaths that we just heard Alicia say in this moment. But what ends up happening is shortly thereafter, those groups who have been organizing all along, like the Movement for Black Lives and Black Lives Matter and BYP 100 and so many others, began to emerge with the, uh, to ramp up the pressure that they have been building toward all along, because those, those are the movement elements out there. And then finally, on the other side, all those other actors now are either emboldened to move forward or have to explain why they're not moving forward or ultimately get caught up in the flood. Uh, what, did, what did Tim Scott say today in Politico? He said, you know, I'm just, a, I'm not the source. I, I don't have the ability to get anything done. I'm one person out of 100, but but I've been stopped by the police and, and, I'm, and they're calling him the conscience of the GOP. Okay, it's your time to step up, man. Why? Because there is no sheltered rear. And one thing is for sure, as they throw these Confederate statues in the street like there's some kind of uh, levy against this flood, as they take down these flags and all this kind of thing, these are concessions trying to forestall the moment when those folks find their backbones and riding the thrust of this movement begin to finally move toward perhaps what William Barber may call the third reconstruction. But, but this is a work in progress, and I know your phone is blowing up just like I, mine and everybody else's with folks trying to confess. I, I, I believe, Alicia, when, again, when you hear Greg say the third reconstruction, we do have to think of this moment 
like they did during the Reconstruction periods. The 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments all happened during Reconstruction. The creation of the Freedmen's Bank was during Reconstruction. And I think as people are sitting here, I mean, first of all, Bob Johnson jumps out there on CNBC, hey, Bob, do me a favor. Come talk to black media if you're going to put out a reparations plan. But at least <laughs> he comes out and th throws out $14 trillion reparations plan. What you're seeing is, are folks who, it, it's again, it comes to, it's a reckoning. And so either you go hard or, frankly, you go home, Alicia. Mm -hmm, correct. And frankly, Roland, you know, we've been on the show before talking about the work that we do at the Black Futures Lab. We did the largest survey of black people in America since Reconstruction. And we did that for the purpose of getting a better understanding of what it is that black folks want to see in this moment and what it, what's the vision that we can start to drive toward together in the form of a black agenda. And frankly, today in front of the Congressional Black Caucus, I talked about our agenda and I talked about one of our demands to redirect $20 billion dollars from military and law enforcement spending into community programs and community infrastructure that actually keeps us safe. That's just one of many demands and one of many uh, items on our agenda that we should be pushing in this moment. If we are meeting this moment with conscience and courage, I think you're right. We will come out of this with uh, today's version of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. But I think we will also come out of this with a different version of what our democracy looks like. Frankly, if it's up to me, I want to see that in November, uh, the morning after Election Day, that Black folks wake up in the morning and say, we were the protagonists of this moment. We actually translated this energy into new laws, but also new people who know that they have a mandate to carry forward the vision of this movement. And we want to make sure that the day after Election Day, that everybody who is left knows that their mandate is to carry out the vision and the purpose of this movement. And Reese, so that, that's why yeah. it's a tipping point right now. And Reese, that mandate, people need to understand, Alicia testified before Congress today, but that mandate is Congress, state, right. county, mm -hmm. city, every lever where you have... It's school districts. So it's not... Mm -hmm. I, I, and I, I, I keep saying this because I, I need people watching right now to mm -hmm. stop asking mm -hmm. the Congressional Black Caucus to do mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. It's yes. federal, yep. state, yep. county, school yep. board, city. You got to hit all of them, Reese. You have to. I think that if people spent half of the energy that they spend on Donald Trump, who's obviously appalling and who is the enemy of progress, but if they channel some of that energy and some of that focus into actually finding out who their local and state and federal representatives are, we would have a much more productive manner of achieving progress. And the same as you just said, Roland, all I see when I look at the NAACP, when I look at the CBC on social media, I see those organizations being attacked. Yet I don't see that same energy for Mitch McConnell, who has posed in front of Confederate flags, who's holding up all this legislation. I don't even see that same energy towards Rand Paul. And so we have to elevate our attention to all of the levers of our society. Some of us live in areas that have black mayors and have black school board officials and have all of these people that are models for the kind of progress that we want to see. So we have to be engaged on every level. We have to be engaged in the off years. We have to be engaged in these county commission meetings, like for instance, in Georgia, in the disaster that we saw with the Fulton County um, elections down there, they had a commission board that same evening to discuss it. So those are the kinds of things that we have to take it upon ourselves to engage beyond the 280 characters, be engaged beyond sharing this or we tweeting that we have to pick up the phone, pick up our emails, go to these meetings, zoom into them, whatever you want to call it, and actually put our energy behind the solutions that we want to see. Under to understand, Erica, how these things are moving so fast, I'm sitting here reading a tweet from the appeal uh, breaking the Louisville Metro Council is expected to, un to unanimously vote to ban the use of no-knock warrants tonight, nearly three months after police killed Breonna Taylor during a raid of her apartment. That does not happen if we're not in this moment. Oh, absolutely. And echoing that everyone said around this calls for engaged citizenry. 
And I think the other part of when people say not to protest, just go and vote, or people say vote because it's important, the comma behind that is then the people who are making those posts is what have you done to hold the people that you voted into office when you went in and you cast your ballot accountable? It's not enough to go in and cast mm -hmm. the ballot if, like Reese said, you're not attending those county or those city commission meetings, if you have not met with your mayor or your local officials, if you don't know who your state representatives are. Because a lot of times, those folks, just like we've seen with Stephen King, who lost his primary contest, well, the person that's coming behind him is a state representative who's been groomed, who's worked with the governor, mm -hmm. who is really a younger profile of a Steve King. He's just well packaged, um, so, um, so to speak. So I think that it calls for engaged citizenry. And when people talk about, um, as uh, we've all talked about, these legacy institutions and then Black Lives Matter, if people would go to Black Futures Lab and pull down and read, I believe the Black Agenda is about a 30 page uh, document. Got Alicia, it. If I'm correct. If you read that document and then find out how can you engage in that document in your local community. Uh, I'm going to go, let me go to this here, but I'm going to go quickly to Greg because he has to step away uh, for a tribute to the late Dr. Conrad Worrell. Uh, he's going to come back to the show. Uh, Greg, on that particular point, again, that in order to have the, the, massive le the massive amounts of change, we have to be thinking multi-level and not just say, CDC, what are y'all going to do? But again, press folks in state capitals, county commissioners, school board members, city council. And that even means if folks need to be running to replace them, that's fine. That's mm -hmm. the only way you see, again, you're hitting all levels at one time. That's exactly right. Um, I'm reminded of the National Negro Congresses of the mid part of this century. Well, 1930s and 40s, the so-called Negro Sanhedrin movement. 1972 in Gary, where you had black elected officials, but black community organizers, black institutional formations all together under one roof that really synergized what become elected state, local, and federal officials. And now we're in a moment where we see this legacy reemerging and uh, beginning to exert its will again. We've got to have elected officials all across the board. And but this we've always made progress when we've had a combination of elected officials and representatives with those who are in the literal street organizing. Understand that movement leaders like Dr. King, who couldn't even become the head of the National Baptist Convention because he ended up in a clash with that organizational formation, Martin King was uh, a person who came in and, and synergized energy. But on the other hand, you had SNCC and other uh, formations who were organized, who were able to tr to use that to create the energy and create the, uh, po the political will that propelled those who were in the halls of power to do that, to do that transformation. So in, in close, what I would say is this, as I do, I'm going to step off. The DuSable Museum has a, a memorial. We're going to talk about your interview, you and Brother Masamela, with Brother Conrad, his last uh, interview on this earth, um, and, and a tribute to him. But these formations rely on all of us to play our role. And as Paul Robeson would say, they, there is no sheltered rear, brother. He, he, everybody's got to make a choice in this one. Uh, Greg, I'll see you in just a second. Alicia, yes, to, to understand where we are, go to my iPad, please. SAG-AFTRA leaders call on police unions to change or lose all support. You're, SAG is a union. And, and, and what you're seeing, and not only that, uh, you're, you're seeing that uh, the leadership of the AFL-CIO, which is actually pushing this House Resolution 1154, uh, one of their folks uh, talked about, again, what's going to ha happen to these unions. Now, what you're seeing is union officials, obviously, uh, are, are concerned about uh, folks who are saying we're targeting this union, but to have people even within the union movement begin to make demands of police unions shows you how far we've moved so quickly. It's actually really, really important, especially in a context where we know that unions are under attack. Unions are being defunded. Unions are being decertified all over the country, and that has been true for the last decade. And so for the labor movement to actually stand up and say, you know, this is a risk that we have to take because we understand that this is a scourge on our movement is an incredible, incredible statement. And we do. We hope that they continue to move forward here. I think, again, we are at an incredible tipping point and it, it's going to require courage 
dedication and steadiness. And I can see, right, that all of us have our eyes focused on the prize, but we need to make sure that that energy continues all the way through November. And, and as, as folks have already said on the panel here, that it doesn't end there, that it continues to grow into a, uh, not only a cross-sectoral movement, but also the kind of movement that is intact in between election cycles as well as during them. Uh, Alicia, I do want to ask you about this here. So again, um, I, I meant to actually hit you earlier. So you got all these conservatives now out here are creating uh, a conspiracy that money that is going to Black Lives Matter is actually going into Democratic coffers. And so they're circulating this video saying, oh, if you go to the blacklivesmatter.com, uh, it's, the money's going to Act Blue, and that's a Democratic pack. And then that's going to the candidates, and candidates are always like, this is illegal. First of all, what a lot of people don't understand, and I was on a call the other day, a lot of people have don't understand that Black Lives Matter is not like the NAACP, where you have a national organization, you have some 2,000 chapters. And so, uh, so the people with this particular video, any perspective, what are they talking about? Uh, people, the donations that are going to Black Lives Matter, like, who is that going to? Can you just speak to that, please? I mean, I wish I could. What I can say is I left the day-to-day -day operations of BLM about two years ago. Got it. ago now, in order to build the Black Futures Lab. But here's what's real. Anytime you have somebody like Candace Owens trying to expose something, then you know that it's powerful and it's a threat to them. And what I can say, right, is that not only is BLM not funneling money into um, Democratic candidates, but you'll remember that in 2016, BLM did not even offer a presidential endorsement. So, I mean, the level of conspiracy theory that's being used right now is not just um, curious, but it's strategic. And, you know, there's nothing that gets attacked if it is not a threat, and so I think that's important for us to remember. Well, I think you're absolutely right, because what's happening right now is... What, 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 is, what is freaking these folks out is how quickly this has moved. And when you're now seeing corporations, and actually, this is going to lead to the last question for you. When you're seeing these corporations now, you know, we're giving this and giving that, it's, it's freaking them out. But on that particular note, I had a conversation with someone who said, we need to be very leery of black organizations accepting donations as opposed to black people accepting investments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've said, okay, Michael Jordan's brand, they're going to give out $100 million over 10 years. That's $10 million a year. Mm -hmm. It's a billion-dollar brand. Um, I saw Adidas, $100 million. Warner Music, $100 million. I saw other folks talk about a million and five million. Again, I go back to, if you're going to big, go big or go home, I think this is where... Black organizations should be demanding not just, oh, thank you for a donation, but what I keep saying, no, no, what's the scorecard? Black board mm -hmm. members, black mm -hmm. senior executives with P&L right. responsibility, minority That's supplier right. development, we, to see true changes and not just folks cutting a check. That's right. I mean, I couldn't agree with you more, Roland, and I, I want to leave us on two points. I mean, one... You know, Black Lives Matter is not and has never just been about policing. It has been how it's been about how black people um, and our lives are represented in every sector of our society. And I have been saying the same thing because, you know, my phone is ringing off the hook and, you know, here and there wants to say, OK, well, this is our this is our contribution to make sure that Black Lives Matter and then also, can you come speak at our lunchtime series and talk to us about racism? And I tell people that's not the work I do. Actually, if I spent my time right, <laughs> right. Of talking to you at your speaker series at lunch, I couldn't do the work that you claim that you're supporting right now, but you can. You can act, You don't need me to come to your speaker series. Actually, you can look around your board table and know exactly the work that you need to be doing. So that's one point. Second point is you're 100% right. You know, three weeks ago, Roland, these same black organizations that um, have a lot more visibility now than we did three weeks ago, um, we're struggling to get resources to build the kind of infrastructure that will allow us to be powerful in November. 
And so this fluctuation of, of visibility and support is a big, big problem. And we have to make sure that even when black isn't cool anymore, we're still invested in building infrastructure for black communities. And then the last thing I want to offer here is based on the point you made, Roland, about Candace Owens and others. I think we have to remember that, um, you know, the folks who are out in the streets right now, people like Patrice and Opal and myself and and the, and the hundreds of other leaders uh, in the movement for Black Lives, um, as this movement becomes more visible, we also become targets. And so it's re important for us to also remember the lessons, right, of the last period of civil rights, the lessons of the last period of Black power. It is important that we not only rally around this movement and get excited about people being in the streets, but that we also keep our eyes on our people. Because we do know that these forces are incredibly nefarious. And we know it from what has happened to Malcolm X. We know it from what happened to Martin Luther King. We know it from what has happened to almost every Black leader that has risen to prominence has been attacked. So we have to keep our eyes on that as well. All right. Alicia Garza, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Folks, uh, hey, Roland, yes. can I jump in on the Act Blue comment? Because I do actually know exactly go ahead, what go that's ahead, referring go to. Go ahead. So I think what, what you're referring to is people, the, the, the right and the conspiracy theories are pushing this notion that Act Blue itself is a pack. That is not true. Act Blue itself is a fundraising apparatus that Democratic uh, candidates and organizations use to fundraise. And so it's completely absurd to say that the name Act Blue means that any any contributions that go there are dispersed to all these candidates. Joe Biden raises money through the fundraising apparatus for Act Blue. So uh, I, I've, I've gone to donate to Black Lives Matter. They use Act Blue as their fundraising apparatus. But that does not mean that when you go to donate to Black Lives Matter, that it goes into this pool and $120 million of it is, is allocated to this candidate or that candidate. So, 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 so essentially, so for people who are, so basically, Act Blue is PayPal. It's exactly. Cash App. It is a, yes. in fact, I, somebody actually sent me an email at, even asking me, was <laughs> at, was, uh, were we on Act Blue? With mm -hmm. my show, and I told him, I said, no, we're not. I said, this is how you can get our show, so we're not. All right, folks, let's go to our second story. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, uh, she has uh, made it perfectly clear, sent a letter to the leaders of the Joint Committee on the Library yesterday requesting that they take action to remove 11 statues of Confederate soldiers and officials from the U.S. Capitol. Now, they are currently statues of Confederacy President Tom Jefferson Davis and Vice President Alexander Stevenson Stevens on display in the Capitol, even though they were both charged with treason. Across the South and other countries, uh, Confederate statues are being taken down every day. Here is Nancy Pelosi. Guys, we have the clip. All right, so uh, let, me, let me try to, fi let me try to uh, uh, find the clip here. Uh, because this is important. I remember just yesterday, Donald Trump said, oh, no, we're not going to sit here uh, and, and, even, and even rename these statues, uh, but, excuse me, these military bases, but guess what? Uh, the Senate actually moved on that. There's Here's Nancy Pelosi. In the country about Confederate symbols, uh, in, such as the statues that have been in Congress for, for decades, uh, it says something to, a, to the durability of those symbols in the Capitol that they're still here despite you being speaker twice. And yesterday you announced you're gonna to try to have them moved. Over in the Senate side, uh, the Armed Services Committee says, or has, has issued, or their bill would reinforce the renaming of Confederate, or bases named after Confederate generals. Can you talk about this phenomenon and whether or not your Defense authorization bill will contain comparable language, and will you f force it through a veto threat? If oh, necessary? the Senate piece you're talking about is their bill that takes them out in three years. Okay. Let me just say that when I was Speaker, I did uh, do what I had the authority to do, which was to relegate Robert E. Lee to the crypt. Uh, and, and I could move things around. I couldn't actually take them out. That requires something else. And that's why I wrote the letter uh, uh, yesterday, or a couple of days ago, June 10th, yesterday, uh, about uh, Stevens. I just, can you imagine Jefferson Davis, Alexander Stevens, treason? 
They committed treason against the United States of America, and their statues are still here because their states put them here. So that's why we're, uh, I wrote to Chairman Blanc, chair of the Rules Committee, and uh, the chair of our House Administration Committee, which is the equivalent committee, Zell Lofgren. And I particularly talked about Alexander Stevens because uh, in the, these are his words. The infamous words of Stevens makes us it clear today, as they did in 1861, the aims of the Confederacy. It's, it has come in his cornerstone speech, and he says, Stevens asserted that the prevailing ideas relied upon by our founders including included the assumption of the equality of man. He goes on to say, this is wrong. And then he goes on from there. You can see my letter and see what he says and see why he has to come out of the Capitol. Now, we do have, if I do believe that the committees have the jurisdiction to move these statues, but we also have legislation, Barbara Lee and Benny Thompson, the chair of Homeland Security Committee, and Barbara Lee, a uh, uh, senior member of the Probations Committee, member of our House Democratic leadership, they have legislation that would um, get rid of, well, we have 11 of them that we have our eye on. Uh, the, but it's now, folks, right now, that was speaking about the statues uh, that are there, but the Senate also voted today in committee, and it actually passed 25 to 2 uh, to advance a bill to the floor of the United States Senate to actually rename these Confederate bases. This is a tweet for Senator Elizabeth Warren. As a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee, I filed an amendment to the annual defense bill last week to rename all bases named for Confederate generals. It's long past time to end the tribute to white supremacy on our military installations. Erica, that passed 25 to 2. Mm -hmm. That says um, the votes may be there for it to pass overwhelmingly in the United States Senate, which means that Donald Trump, if this bill, if Mitchell, now here's the deal, it has to go to the floor. Mitch McConnell could very well try to protect Trump. But if this bill gets voted on in the Senate and passed in the House, Donald Trump will be in a position where he will be forced to veto a bill naming mil name, to rename military bases after Confederate heroes. Oh, that's manna from heaven for black folks and others who need to understand exactly where this man is coming from. Absolutely, and that would be red meat for our base. I just want to first start with that question that that journalist asked around um, Nancy, uh, Speaker Pelosi having been speaker twice. And um, as Reese has talked about having that same energy, thinking about Paul Ryan, thinking about the marijuana multimillionaire John Boehner and Newt Gingrich, um, these mm -hmm. questions were never posed to them. But as a person who grew up as a military brat, who was also a veteran, and then worked on the federal side as well, this is important because uh, having those installations named and actually committing to serving your country and understanding that treason um, and, uh, is celebrated, particularly uh, in the form of white people, is something that's also been very troubling. And to have these flags that have also been posted across uh, federal installations across these United States. So there is a lot in the way of symbolism when it is said that these statues, that these uh, symbols of treason, that these symbols of rebellion, uh, particularly when military people and federal folks are called to the standard to have allegiance to protect this country against all enemies, both foreign and domestic, uh, bows uh, fantastically and is something that is of great importance. And so as we continue to, as Alicia talked about, um, move towards this tipping point, um, and we have 35 Senate seats that are actually up for grabs this year, I think that it is also uh, politically expedient for uh, those folks to look at what is important, uh, and then those things that could help them retain their seats or lose their seats as well. This is an important thing, Greg. Again, people say symbols don't matter, but they do. This is for all the Dinesh D'Souza's of the world who love talking about Democrats and the Klan and who opposed uh, Jim Crow. 
This will put Republicans square in the spot of defending Confederate statues. They are doing it in Alabama. They are doing it here in, I mean, doing it in Virginia. Now Trump will, will sit here and say, oh, so you're cool with Confederate memorials. Well, we're talking about what may be emerging as chaos theory, Roland. I mean, you put your finger on it. Uh, only two people uh, on the committee voted against it. Uh, James Inhofe of Oklahoma, where Tulsa is, of course, uh, the chairman of the committee, and uh, young Josh Hawley, the extremist out of Missouri, the home of Dredd and Harriet Scott. Uh, they are waving what, what used to be called in the 19th century the bloody shirt. Uh, they're defending the Confederacy, and they should, because as white nationalists, it is their job. Uh, I think in terms of chaos, though, Donald Trump is not only doubling and tripling down. You know, anytime the, the, the New York Times and mass commercial entertainment media begin to catch on and compare what he's doing now to what George Wallace did in 1968, I think they're getting close to where we've been all along. They, they're dropping all pretenses now. And Mitch McConnell, who said in the wake of this committee vote that it, it should be left to the states, is going to try to play this out as long as he can. We don't know if the Crypt Keeper, the man in charge of dead things, is going to be in charge of this dead thing called the Confederate States of America and their monuments. Of those 10 bases, one of which is in Louisiana, named for a PTG Beauregard, the same man that Jeff Sessions, who's trying to return to that Senate, is named for, three of those bases are right across the river from where you're sitting in Virginia, including one for Pickett. This is what it comes down to. This, this, this surrender of Confederate symbols, as we see there, even, even Christopher Columbus, these, 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 uh, these surrender of these white nationalist, white supremacist figures is a turning point in the history of this country when we understand that the Confederate states, in many ways, won the Civil War in terms of cultural ideology. And if, and if that is going to stop being the case in this country, people are going to have to choose between white nationalism and a new concept of this country. Hawley's made his choice. Inhofe's making his choice. Trump is pushing them to make his choice because he realizes now he's not going to try to build a bridge. He's just going to try to burn one, circle his wagons, and ride this till the wheels fall off. Um, this is, I mean, that's the thing here, Reese. I think people, again, understanding what he's doing. Donald Trump desperately needs to appeal to white nationalist, white supremacists. Has to. Polling numbers, CNN's poll, Joe Biden up 14 points. Uh, his approval rating, 38%. Uh, even Rasmussen, mm -hmm. the, the, the favorite polling company of Donald Trump, showing awful numbers. He ain't hide nothing. And so he could sit here and have all those Negroes in the White House yesterday sitting around the table. You could have Raynard. Oh, by the way, Raynard finally decided to get back with us. He want, He's going to be here Sunday, 7 to 8. You, 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 better, you better eat some Wheaties that morning. Because trust me, your ass will have a problem, <laughs> Raynard. You can have all them Negroes talking, but the reality is this here. You can't get around this man defending Confederate memorials. It's his ideology. It's not a matter of needing to appeal to white supremacists. He is a white supremacist. He is, as Erica often points out, the son of a Klansman. He is the the grand wizard in chief. And so this is not and by any means an act. It's actually his ideology when he has Stephen Miller, who is a white supremacist, writing this so-called race speech, who is the author and the architect of the Muslim ban and child separation policy. This is exactly who Donald Trump is. It is exactly how he plans to govern. And to be honest, as uh, Dr. Carr said, it's 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 forcing people to take a side because when you look at the polling, you know people like to say, "Oh, this is a matter of Southern heritage and Southern pride." No, it is a matter of where you stand with or against white supremacy. Now, you could say you're against it and still go on and perpetuate it, but at least on this particular topic of these symbols, you have to choose a side. And so that's what we're seeing, and we're going to see which side Donald Trump uh, chooses. We know where he chooses in his heart. We know where he chooses in his head, because we see how he governs. We see how he acts. But in terms of where he chooses to, to side in terms of this political um, fight, that remains to be seen. But I don't have any faith in him actually doing the right thing or at least pretending to do the right thing and actually standing against these Confederate symbols. And, and not only that, if you want to see how much of a joke this guy is, Erica, Greg, and Reese, 
Today he was in Dallas holding a roundtable on police and race. In Dallas, the top three law enforcement officers are African American. The top three. DA, police chief, sheriff, Erica, all three were not invited. Oh, of course not. But this is the same mediocre, uh, as Reese just pointed out. I love uh, letting know by tweet that he is the offspring, the son of a Klansman, that is going to have a rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma, on Juneteenth. So really kind of the, full, uh, um, the false outrage, outrage around, you know, does he have a bottom? Uh, will we see him ha kind of come to his senses? Hell no. We told y'all this in 2015. So, uh, you know, really to expect more of somebody who's mediocre, who has the vocabulary of a third grader, who uh, uses conspiracy theories um, by way of tweet to uh, discount what is reality, the expectation of Donald John Trump to do anything outside of what he's known for doing which is lying. This is the same person that posed as a publicist to get himself in page six. There is the expectation for him to do anything um, seemingly of a, uh, that an adult would do to have add any type of value is really of, of no regard. And, and people should not have an expectation of that. I mean, he has gone to a uh, different manufacturing plant, not wearing masks, clearly endangering everyone around him. This is the same person that uh, talked about drinking, uh, you know, substances that are harmful to the body in order to remove COVID. So I think that as we continue to see him doing, as Reese said, just really Trump being Trump, that the expectation should be just where it is. It, he's a mediocre person, and it should just kind of remain that way. White House Greg defends it by saying, oh, he was going to hear other views. Give me a break. You don't come to a place to have a discussion about police and race, and you ignore the fact that the top three law enforcement officers all black in the city. Roland, um, and this is for everyone watching and everybody who will watch this later as it's being recorded and broadcast. This is the distinction between folks with experience, folk who have studied, and folk who connect the lessons we should have learned in the past to the different battles we fight today. Some things are consistent. Donald Trump is engaged in the politics of distraction. Please understand, Texas, he's doing electoral math while he's out here acting crazy. So Texas, they can't stand to lose Texas between voter suppression, between messing up everything on the ground so that they can diminish the number of people who are, who are voting. And we see now that the number of people who have registered, Republican, Democrat, or Independent, has cratered in the wake of this epidemic, as this epidemic is still unfolding. He goes to Dallas to send a message, as we're saying. Uh, uh, George P. Bush, the Texas land commissioner, who, of course, the son of Jeb Bush, comes out with a full-throated endorsement of Trump. They're playing electoral math. He's going to Tulsa. This is, these are distractions. I mean, they're interesting to talk about, they're necessary to talk about, but ultimately they're distractions. Remember in 1968, Richard Nixon concedes five Southern states to George Wallace and wins an overwhelming victory in the Electoral College because those racists that don't live in those five Southern states line up to vote for him in the places he needs to put it close enough to steal. Come forward. Where did Ronald Reagan announce his campaign for president? Philadelphia, Mississippi, where they found James Cheney and Mickey Schwerner and Andrew Goodman. He's sending a message, Ronald Reagan. And just like, finally, Donald Trump took his Make America Great Again slogan from that one, Ronald Reagan, he's also taking the politics of distraction from him as well. This fool is running around, but he crazy like a fox in this one. The more we talk about this, the less we look at the fact that there are a lot of white nationalists in those states that need to get close enough to steal. And that, I think, is one of the reasons he goes to Dallas, ignores the elected leadership, and says, I'm sending, I, I want to meet with other voices. He needs those other voices. He's counting on them to be, to paraphrase uh, Richard Nixon, to repurpose him, a silent majority in the Electoral College. And keep in mind, they're tied in Texas, according to the polls. Folks, Army General Mark Milley, the nation's top military officer, the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said that he, today that he was wrong to accompany Donald Trump on a walk through Lafayette Square that ended in a photo op at St. John's Church. This is what 
he said. I am outraged by the senseless and brutal killing of George Floyd. And we should all be proud that the vast majority of protests have been peaceful. Peaceful protest means that American freedom is working. And I'm also proud of the response of our National Guard forces, who provided excellent support to local law and state enforcement, but under the control of state governors in more than 30 states across the country. We never introduced federal troops in the streets of America as a result of the combined efforts of the National Guard and law enforcement at quelling the violence and de-escalating very, very tense situations. As many of you saw the result of the photograph of me at Lafayette Square last week, that sparked a national debate about the role of the military in civil society. I should not have been there. My presence in that moment and in that environment created a perception of the military involved in domestic politics. As a commissioned uniformed officer, it was a mistake that I've learned from. And I sincerely hope we all can learn from it. Reese, the military demands order. What they cannot handle is when you have folks who are saying, hell no, is an uproar. The right. only reason he put that video out, because there has been an uproar in the military. They have not gone public with it. But there's been an uproar among a lot of generals saying you, he dishonored the uniform by accompanying Trump. And to see American citizens hit with tear gas and mm -hmm. push out the way they did for a photo op, no, this is cleaned up on aisle six by the Joint Chiefs of Staff head. Absolutely. And it, it's it's very necessary cleaned up. And I definitely... Um, you know, his his apology to me is a little hollow. I, I don't necessarily buy it, but I do think at a minimum, what I appreciate about it is that whoever out there in Trump world, all these MAGA people who might think that they're going to have some sort of insurrection, some sort of uh, coalition with, with, with the military under Trump's watch, think again. I th think that this general is showing that Okay, you had your fun, Trump, but that's where you're not gonna fool us twice. You know, fool me once, shame on me, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. And so I'm hoping that this is a sign that the generals at the military will take more precautions in how they go along with these stunts that Donald Trump um, pulls, because we don't want the, uh, the the American citizens to have an erosion of trust with the separation of the different powers, and we certainly do not want a military state. So I, I think what he did was appropriate. I like. Like I said, am I entirely convinced? No, but it's absolutely necessary. And of course, uh, Erica, when 43% of the military are people of color, you might want to listen to what they got to say. Oh, absolutely. And be clear, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is the highest ranking officer in the military. He's also the military advisor to the president and to the SecDef, the Secretary uh, of Defense. And thinking about what he wore, and, and we've been talking about symbols and imagery, uh, those fatigues. When I was in the military, we called them BDUs or battle dress uniforms. And you're talking about that alongside a person who considers himself in a battle with people who don't agree with his ideology. And, and thinking about those 43% of black and brown people that are serving in uniform, what a slap in the face that was to see him out um, in some level of violation of the UCMJ, I would believe that's the Uniform Code of Military Justice that says that military folks cannot be in uniform out at a protest. And so I think that it was very necessary for him to make the statement that he made, particularly when we're thinking about the infiltration of white nationalists in not only law enforcement, but in the military as well. For him to, um, as uh, Reese talked about, his words were a bit hollow, but it was very necessary for him to make that statement because you have people that serve in the enlisted and in the officer rank that are under his uh, command. Greg? Listen, I, I'm, I'm appreciative uh, of Sister Erica walking us through uh, the protocol. Because as you said, when four out of every 10 persons serving in the military is non-white, but everybody knows the rules, a lot of our people have been very vocal, I'm sure, as this happened. And it's very important to understand that in a society where the military is perceived as being political, it is the, uh, it is the prerequisite for, in some ways, coup d'etat. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this moment, 
if you don't have the discipline within the military to maintain order, then you te you're teetering on the brink of politically having uh, of having it fracture politically along all lines. Now, what does that mean? We just heard Erica just walked us through it. At the linchpin of military discipline, at least the way I think I understand it, and I'm glad that you know Erica again has walked us through that, is morale. And so, you know, I, Roland, when you had uh, Charles Brown, when you played that Charles Brown piece the other day, man, and this brother's been confirmed as the first black chief of st staff for the Air Force. When you played that man, I had to put down this work I was doing. You could, this man was struggling. Do you understand? He felt the whole weight of a race as he was trying to articulate what he wants to do. And then he said, you know, I'm just one man. But it was a different way he said, I'm just one man, than what Tim Scott said. I'm mm -hmm. just one man. No, this brother was like, I'm going to do everything I can, but y'all understand. Mm -hmm. This this military is woven together out of separate strands. And if you're going to keep it together, you better recognize that at any given moment, it could dissolve. And yeah. that's why we saw this man come out there today, because I find it, in fact, a little disingenuous to believe that you were, thought you were walking across the street to inspect some troops. Oh, but what right. it may reveal, finally, is that the fractures within this little band of fascists, this little toady uh, William Barr, this mm -hmm. little Cretan Stephen Miller, who's going to unleash racial fury in Tulsa through this speech he's writing, and Trump, these that's a faction there. But this guy's coming in, and he says, you know, I'm Joint Chiefs of Staff. Yeah, I don't like this. We've been having a shouting match about you wanting to send the military everywhere, and now we pushed you back. I'm going to walk across this street. But after he, as you said, he walked across that street, all them people started screaming in every rank. And guess what? You figured, oh, my God, yeah, I better say something now. This was a huge mistake. That was unprecedented, the speech we saw him give today, at least as far as I know in American history. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, folks, got to go to break. We come back. The brother is trying to get the Democratic nomination to oppose Mitch McConnell in Kentucky. But the Democrats in D.C. are supporting the white woman he's running against. We'll talk with... State, Senator, State Representative Booker from Kentucky next on Roller Martin Unfiltered. You want to support Roller Martin Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to rollermartinunfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. All right, folks, check these headphones out right here. Roll the uh, video if you can. Uh, the folks at Seek.com, of course, black-owned company, uh, launched by Mary Spio. She is the designer of these headphones, these 360-degree 4D headphones. Unbelievable sound. Uh, gamers love them because you can hear everything. Uh, they're Bluetooth as well. Uh, you can use them to make phone calls. Uh, all you got to do, folks, is use the promo code right here, RMVIP2020, RMVIP2020 at seek.com. All of you will get a discount because you're fans of this show. And so go to seek.com. And so understand, when you're buying the headphones, support the black-owned company, a sister who designed this, a sister from Ghana uh, who uh, designed these. And so I know people love buying, you know, um, you know, Bose or JBL, other headphones, but you talk about you want to support black and buy black, seek.com, C-E-E-K.com, and of course, using the promo code RMVIP2020. Uh, Senator Mitch McConnell, the majority leader in the United States Senate, has made it his mission to block any legislation designed to help African Americans. Also, though, he is up for election in November. Democrats need a net gain of four seats to take control of the United States Senate. One of the folks who wants to make that possible is Kentucky State Representative Charles Booker, who joins us right now. Welcome back to Roller Martin Unfiltered. Thank you, sir. It's good to be with you again. You've been giving folks hell in Kentucky, giving an impassionate speech the other day, trying to get folks there to understand uh, what's happening when it comes to police reform, what's happening when it comes to Black Lives Matter. Uh, are they paying any attention? Are they listening? Yes, they are. Uh, and I'm excited to share that even today, after weeks of crying out in the streets and grieving in real time and demanding accountability, that our Metro Council here in Louisville unanimously moved in support of a ban on no-knock warrants. 
And, you know, that's the very mechanism that was used to justify kicking in Breonna Taylor's door and killing her in her home. So, you know, we're crying out and we're standing up and it's showing that when we do that, we can win. Um, one of the things that uh, is also happening is that um, w when you look at uh, the election, um, your opponent was questioned by, uh, I think there was a debate, and in terms of where was she uh, when it came to uh, the protest. I'm looking for it right now, and you've got others who are running against... I think, I think that's... Uh, is, is the sports guy still in there? Mike Jones, is he still in the race? So, how, first of all, how many people are in the race? So, the, there are nine folks that are formally in the race. Um, at this point, it is really between uh, myself and Amy McGrath, who is the DSCC's candidate, calls herself a pro-Trump Democrat, and you mentioned Matt Jones. Um, he has actually endorsed me. Uh, and so we're building the momentum to win this race, and we will. So you've been... You talk about endorsements. Louisville Courier-Journal uh, endorsed you. Uh, also, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders, uh, Congresswoman Alexand Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, has endorsed you as well. Um, but what's interesting is that you're right. The Democrats in D.C., they put all their chips behind Amy McGrath, who's actually said that, hey... I'm somebody who can work with Trump if I get elected. Did I mishear her say that? Oh, she said it multiple times with a straight face. And the people of Kentucky are like, well, what in the world are you talking about? You know, anyone that is listening to our struggles and our challenges and understands our needs for real change in this Commonwealth would never say that their goal is to help Donald Trump be successful. He has been crushing us every turn of the way, and Mitch McConnell is holding his coattails while he does it. You know, we, we have a real choice in this primary. We can stand up and push for structural change, or we can play the status quo that makes us lose over and over again. And you mentioned that debate where the question was asked of, actually, of Amy. Yeah, Edwards. actually, I found yeah. it. Actually, I found it. So, guys, go to my iPad. I want everybody to watch this. The protesters the last three days or in Lexington or elsewhere? Ms. McGrath. I have not. And why? Well, I've been with my family, and I've had some family... Uh, things going on this past weekend, but I've been following the news and, you know, and watching and, and making sure that, uh, you know, I, I think in, we're in the middle of a pandemic. So we also have to look at, you know, is that the place to be right now? So that's, that's really why. I stand before you as your brother, as your cousin, as your neighbor, as your fellow good troublemaker. My name is Charles Booker. I, I saw the video that I was sort of... I'm like, she's stuttering and stammering and trying to figure out what to say. I had family in town. You're running for the United States Senate. You're right. You're right. And you know what? I was with my family, too, in the streets getting hit with tear gas, demanding justice and accountability. And you know what we need now is, is not the same old political status quo that gives excuses the dancers away from the challenges we face. We need someone that's going to stand on the front lines. And I've done it. I'm doing it out of survival. And the people of Kentucky know that that's the type of leadership we need right now. And, you know, we're not going to go back. We're not going to sit down and be quiet. And we're definitely not going to play those political games. And so I'm excited about the momentum we're building because people know they have a real choice and they're standing with me. When is the uh, primary in Kentucky? The primary is June 23rd. All right, then. Well, uh, if folks want more information on your candidacy, where do they go? You can go to Booker4Kentucky.com. We're building a movement to not only beat Mitch McConnell, but transform our future, and we're going to do it. All right, then. Uh, Charles Booker, we certainly appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Thank you, sir. All right, folks. Earlier today, I had an opportunity to talk with the governor of New Jersey, Phil Murphy, uh, not only about the protests taking place across the country, uh, but also what's happening in his state to help small businesses deal with the issues of voting, as well as his recent appointments of several African-Americans to high positions. Here's our conversation. Governor Murphy, glad to have you on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Nice to be on with you, Roland. Honored, honored to be here. I appreciate it. Let's get right to it. First of all, have you been shocked and surprised at the rapid developments of how things have just moved since the death of George Floyd? When you look at with police departments, when you look at corporations, when you look at folks apologizing, you got editors of media outlets resigning, people owning up to not doing enough about racism and discrimination. Yep. 
The answer is yes, happily. Um, I am a former uh, board member, the national board member of the NAACP, and so uh, I, 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 I go back with that organization a, a bunch of years. And if you had asked me then, as a board member 15 years ago, whenever it was, uh, if I thought we would see what we've seen over the past three weeks, I would have I would have begged on my knees for the national consciousness uh, and awakening that we're seeing, but I would not have predicted it. And I certainly, I don't even think I would have predicted it uh, three months ago, uh, but but there it, it is overwhelming. I've participated in two protests myself, uh, one a largely community of color, one a largely white community, and in both cases, thousands of people showing up, overwhelming. Uh, obviously, uh, people have to, and I've been talking about this reckoning, if you will, uh, and this need for that. Uh, what is happening in your state? Uh, what is happening with the state police? Uh, what, what advice are you giving to mayors uh, and other officials that they need to be doing so the public can have trust that police officers are doing what's right in New Jersey? Yeah. So first of all, on the protest, just to say that, we've had over 300 of them, now well over 300, 58 arrests. And they, those arrests were in three uh, incidents that happened in the first couple of days of protests. So it's been overwhelming anger, frustration, mad as hell, not going to take it anymore, but peaceful. Secondly, um, I got elected. The phrase that we use most often to to uh, pursue a stronger and fairer New Jersey that works for everybody. Now, admittedly, Roland, that was overwhelmingly economic. We were neither strong, we didn't grow, and we were profoundly unfair. But the, but the fairness lens could apply to healthcare uh, realities, educational, housing, uh, not just your paycheck or benefits. So from the get-go, we have been working on uh, sh shrinking as best we can. And believe me, it's a work in progress, a big amount of those inequities, and a lot of them are in the criminal justice sphere. So I signed, a, 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 I think it's nationally a landmark independent prosecution bill last year. If there's any shooting involved with police officers or if there's a fatality, it must be pursued independently and end up with presentation to a, a grand jury. Um, we, we, we put together a, a criminal sentencing and disposition commission, which has given us explicit uh, guidance for um, uh, legislation that we need to enact on, and I hope sooner than later. The attorney general just last week uh, stood beside me, uh, and, and, and we're going to review for the first time in 20 years our use of force guidelines. We're now going to license police officers. We have not done that as a state. Uh, and that process is underway. And there's a whole other pieces of what I think is a mosaic of a much stronger and deeper uh, relationship between law enforcement and the communities they serve, which are on the table uh, for consideration and, and analysis. And we're doing that actively. Uh, that stuff is, is critically important. But one of the things that I keep reminding people is that, look, the federal government, you have a bill on that level. Obviously, you're on the state level. But most the most action really has to be on the city level. And so yep. now you're talking about those city contracts with police unions, but also communicating uh, with various police officers. And, and what I've said to people, that, that the mobilization has to understand that you've got to be able to hit all those different levels uh, in order yes. to be able to, to see those changes through. It's not like one go-to place, then it fixes everything downstream. 100%, which is why the, the peaceful demonstrations, we've got 565 communities in our state. There have been over 300 demonstrations. Uh, they weren't in 300 different communities, but I'm going to tell you they were probably 150 to 200. Uh, it, it just for those moments in time, you're beholden overwhelmingly to local leadership, whether it's elected officials, faith, law enforcement locally. And again, we've been gratified. A couple of other models, though, to your point, Roland. You know, Camden, New Jersey, which has been a, a, a community that's been crushed in so many ways over the past number of decades, uh, sort of uh, converted its uh, police department into a county force and essentially um, just uh, adopted a new law enforcement uh, structure there. Uh, they, they've been given particular kudos in the early days after George Floyd's murder in terms of the police and the law enforcement and community engagement. Newark, New Jersey, our largest community, 
uh, has been under the auspices of a civilian review board for quite some time, which has been mandated, but it's clearly made a difference. Uh, you look at, at how extraordinarily peaceful Newark has been, and, and again, not taking anything away from the anger, the frustration, the come on, in year one of century five, since slavery has come to our shores, um, uh, you know, who, who could ignore the, the, the stench and, and stain of racism, but it's been done with great uh, uh, partnership uh, and peacefully. Um, the, obviously, police reform is one thing, but this reckoning that we're seeing is now affecting so many diff different areas as well. Uh, I was on a call yesterday, and we were talking about what's happening in education, uh, where black educators are saying, now the folks should be listening to us. It's happening in media. It's happening in finance. It's happening elsewhere. Um, what direction or what advice would you give to your companies, your small businesses, your foundations, all the, the, this, this, the system in your state yep. to confront this reckoning and say, look, the issue of race has been pervasive in America. You can't, not, you can't act as if it has had no impact on whatever your particular area of interest is. Yep, amen. I mean, my simple, and I don't have all the answers rolling by any means, and, and uh, I have not walked in the shoes of, of, of black men and women in this country, uh, but I would say embrace the moment. Uh, words, I, I ran the risk the other day when I was talking about this that, that I implied that words didn't matter. I think words do matter. We've got to be really responsible, particularly as leaders right now, in, 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 in how we use those words. But it's got to be much more than words. Embrace the moment. Take the actions that we, we've been, you know, we've, we've acknowledged, but we haven't gotten there yet. Uh, and by the way, we have too few, too few role models of, of, of persons in big positions where young folks can look and say, you know what, I, I can relate, I share that experience, that life experience. I'm honored last Friday, actually last Wednesday, I appointed the first black woman to be the head of policy, Dr. Zakia Smith-Ellis, who has been our secretary of higher education. On Friday, I nominated uh, Haitian-American Fabiana Pierre-Louis, first black woman uh, to serve on our Supreme Court. I think that's another thing we need more of. We need folks who, who have lived the experience that people can relate to. But I'll give you an action that, that we have got to get to. So we've been like most every state, I guess, in America, remote learning since March. We were one of the states that closed down earliest. Um, we have, we've got tens of thousands of kids who live in families that don't have the ability or access to a device uh, to learn from home the way the other kids are learning. Uh, and we had to do a lot of work around. All right, folks, uh, let me know what's going on there. Uh, the uh, have a technical issue there, so let me know if we restart it. Uh, so we can pick it up there, uh, so we can finish that, uh, because I do want you to hear what the governor has to say uh, about those black appointments, but also the help for small black businesses uh, in New Jersey, plus voting. So are we ready? All right. Okay, all right, so uh, so let me do this here. So let, let me know when we have that fixed so I can go back to it. Uh, I want to go to this story uh, here, and that is uh, uh, Byron Allen has uh, settled his... Uh, lawsuit with Comcast. You might remember that case went all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled nine to nothing against Byron Allen, sending it back to the lower court. Uh, he sued Comcast and other cable companies, alleging that they were uh, limiting his ability uh, to be able to get on their cable systems. And again, it was a $20 billion lawsuit filed in 2015. Uh, but they announced today that he is dropping that particular lawsuit, and Comcast has reached an agreement with Allen's entertainment company, uh, his company Entertainment Studios, to pick up three of his channels, uh, Comedy.tv, Recipe.tv, and JusticeCentral.tv. Uh, this from the LA Times, excuse me, from Variety. The pack also amends the term of Comcast's existing deal to carry the Weather Channel, which Allen's company acquired in 2018. It also covers the retransmission consent rights to 14 local TV stations that Allen Media Group has acquired in the past few months. Quote, we are excited, excited to begin a new phase of partnership with Comcast and Xfinity, including the distribution of our cable channels for the first time on Xfinity platforms, said Allen. 
Um, Greg Carr, I want to go to you first. A lot of people, a lot of people were uh, talking about this, uh, championing Byron Allen's cause. He came on this show. He came on, he went on The Breakfast Club. He was saying, uh, break up Comcast. He was, uh, he was uh, partnering with, you know, had CBC. Uh, Congress, Congressman Bobby Rush and others were writing letters, echoing those same comments. Uh, and now, uh, and first of all, we did reach out to Byron Allen. He is not offering any further comment other than the statement here. Uh, I did personally reach out and talk to him today. Um, Greg, your thoughts? Big fella, Big Byron, here's what you do now, big boy, because you've proven what Big Daddy Kane said in the negative. The Big Daddy Kane said pimping ain't easy, but you done proved that pimping is easy. Now that you've pimped the race, big fella, here's your job, Chief, Chief Rocker. Your job now is to make good on employing black folks, which would be a little different than what you've done in the past. Your job now is to use your platform and your resources for the elevation of the race, big fella. Let me tell you why, big fella. Let me tell you why, big boy. Because the Civil Rights Act of 1866 mm -hmm. was passed after the 13th Amendment, but before the 14th Amendment. In fact, the Civil Rights Act of 1866, codified in Section 1981 of federal law, says that black people had a right to make and enforce contracts and, and be treated as if they were a white man. In other words, the, the, really, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 has more powerful language than the 14th Amendment, equal protection and due process. You rolled the Civil Rights Act of 1866 into court, and when the Ninth Circuit agreed with you that Comcast had discriminated against you, you took it to the, they took it to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled nine to nothing with Neil Gorsuch delivering the opinion that you had to meet a higher standard. For those of you who need to understand what I'm talking about, I'm gonna keep this real short. This is what the Supreme Court said back in March when they heard Allen's lawsuit. They said that you must not only prove going into court or establish the possibility as a matter of uh, a trial of fact that race was used by Comcast to determine whether or not your networks would be carried, but you must also establish that but for the use of race, but for the use of race, you would have gotten your networks in conne connected to them. Now, Roland, you had Kristen Clark on, our sister. You had Brother Derek on from the NAACP, Derek Johnson, walking us through why narrowing the standard and elevating that, bur that standard would eviscerate the Civil Rights Act of 1866. So they kicked it back to the lower court for you to be able to do that. Of course, your tactic was done, your tactic is to get in court so you can get discovery so you can go through Comcast files. But 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 big fella in, in, to end this. If your whole tactic was to rally the race behind you, because you ain't never been that black when it come to us, to rally the race behind you so that you could get Comcast to settle with you, and I suspect it was, that what you gotta do now going forward is proved to us you was as black as you were six months ago when you rang the alarm bell and the race came to your defense. Because right now you're looking real suspect, big fella. Erica. Woo, we just need to breathe from the heat off of uh, <laughs> Dr. Carr's commentary. And I'm so glad that you walked everyone through, Dr. Carr, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1866, because I was uh, one of the people that was on that call with the NAACP when they narrowed and talked about specifically how this would impact black folks when you're talking about competing for contracts, when you're thinking about perhaps buying a home or getting an apartment, um, how all that very, this um, very uh, uh, decision by the Supreme Court does funnel down and impact it, uh, impacts us. And so I, I agree with Dr. Carr that uh, with all of the engagement that he got from this platform, from Roland, from everybody, the roll call, everybody that was said, the folks that um, just are in the general public, that there is now a do-out that's owed. And I think that he needs to know that, um, and uh, expressly so with the different channels that he uh, now has, that even thinking about this platform, which is Black media, that is very much so dedicated to not only delivering news, but also connecting the dots and allowing people to see how uh, things that we see throughout the day impacts us on the day-to-day. -day. So I, I completely agree with Dr. Greg Carr, and um, it's always been very interesting to me, kind of the way that Byron Allen went about it, 
But uh, now he's really got to cut the check with his community. What's your thoughts, Arisi? That's, that's a lot of heat coming from uh, both Erica and Dr. Carr. Um, you know, my, my girl, Senator Kamala Harris, led an amicus brief in that case to talk about how damaging the but for, um, you know, standard is. But I mean, I, I, I listen to what you guys have to say, and I feel like you're much more well versed in it than that. If the whole point, ultimately, these cases do have a point, right? Which is to win um, what you know, Byron Allen seemed to get concessions from Comcast on. So I, I completely understand the kind of the heat towards him on, like you said, Dr. Carr rallying the race behind him. So ultimately, to that it ended up just being about enriching his pockets. But um, I, to, on this, I defer to, to you all, as, particularly you, Dr. Carr, and what are the implications now that the Supreme Court has ruled in this way? It's been kicked down to the Ninth Circuit, and well, then uh, well, Byron the, Allen has dropped, dropped basically the case. That's what I'm interested in understanding. Well, um, the, the thing is, um, what you're dealing with, the Supreme Court has ruled. So mm -hmm. actually, Greg, you would have to have, Congress would have to um, redefine, I suppose, that law uh, to fix or put it back in place what was there before. That one's tough, Roland. We, we spend a lot of time with this when I, when I teach 1981 over at Howard Law School we, when we deal with this. What has happened now is they've settled now, so it's moot, but the district court would then re-examine whether or not Allen met that burden. So really, in, in some ways, the Supreme Court punted back to the district court. So to, to, to pick up on, on what Reese just laid out, the, 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 the district court would then go back through and determine whether or not Allen did meet the but for standard. Now, let's say that they, they, they said that he did, or let's say that they, they said that he didn't. It would then go back to the Court of Appeals, and the Ninth Circuit would get another bite at the apple. So ultimately, it was going to head back to the Court of Appeals, I mean, to the uh, yeah, Court of Appeals and to the Supreme Court again. So, but 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 the threat, as Kristen walked us through, as uh, Derek walked us through, when you talked about it, when they made the decision, the threat is that once, as we heard Erica say, you create that but for standard, that's almost an impossible standard to reach, and you've left it now in the hands of judges. Again, why do elections matter? They're still replacing district court judges, y'all. So a right. judge will now determine, and there's no way for Congress to strengthen that law. Understand, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 says that blacks have the rights to make and enforce contracts and other rights, positive rights, and to be treated as if a white man. But between the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and today, courts have interpreted that to apply even to white people, therefore neutralizing the idea that whiteness becomes a standard that applies to black people and reinforcing the power of whiteness over and beyond what the statute literally says, what it says on its face. So what I'm saying all that is to say that, Brother Byron, I seem to remember a little comedy show where you were the token black called Real People. If we being <laughs> real, and real, as you say, Roland, recognize real, you took a gamble that you could use the Civil Rights Act of 1866 to get more money. And in the process, you endangered us. And by settling, you have at least pulled back out before the courts get another bite of this apple. And y'all better line up and register to vote, because if you don't vote and the wrong person gets in and they put a few more judges on, you don't want to see the Civil Rights Act of 1866 come into court, because we can all predict what's going to happen the next time it shows up. I recall when we had Byron Allen on the show, this was back in December, um, John Hope Bryant, founder of Operation Hope, uh, had released a video where he said, look, this is a dispute between a private company and Comcast. Byron Allen said on the show that John Hope Bryant's analysis was wrong. After today's news, John Hope Bryant dropped this video. But uh, uh, a very, very uh, insightful, thoughtful, and well-connected person in black America uh, who let me know that, as I have been saying, uh, uh, Byron Allen settled. Uh, I was, you know, I did this video a year ago, not a year ago, eight months ago, six months ago, something. And I mean, people were, hey, Lamont, hey, Rakita, people were just, oh, John, you don't know what you're talking about. And this is about civil rights and social justice. And this has to go to the Supreme Court. Byron knows what he's doing. And, you know, this is about all of us. And this is about, and I kept saying, look, all of us are not shareholders <laughs> of Byron <laughs> Allen's company. All of us are not going to get any money if Byron hits settles, which he will. <laughs> this is not about all of us. This is about his
wallet, which by the way is fine. I want the brother to be successful. I, I mean, I haven't seen Brian Ray Allen in the black community before this last year. I don't know if I see my brother Byron is when I'm at a resort uh, when I go to once or twice a year, which by the way, fantastic, all good. But but he shows up and he's all over the black community. He's writing checks to nonprofits and organizations. Let's see if that continues. By the way, part of what I want to say here is I want to see uh, I want to see this largesse that has just been uh, deal cut shared with all the folks who backed him. And, and if he does that, I'm more than happy. Uh, but I doubt he's going to do what I'm going to suggest. So look, what I said is you have four kinds of people: hunters, gatherers, hunters you know, Skinner gathers and cooks. And then you've got spectators. I'll repeat that. You know, I, I detail this in my new book uh, coming out in October, Up From Nothing. Pre-order it now. Hunter, and no, I'm not, this is not about you buying my book. I care less whether you buy the book or not. I'll give you the book. Uh, hunters, I'm a hunter, all right? Uh, uh, Skinner gathers, all right? That's sort of, sort of the analysts, the reviewers, underwriters, uh, you know, accountants in, the com in a company, right? And cooks, and that's folks who prepare uh, the product in a company in a home of course the cook is you know the person who takes the, the, the house and turns it into a home so everybody has a role my concern was black America in this situation was just the spectator we're on social media we're we're protesting we're 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 blogging we're writing stories we're going on the media we won we won what did we win let me explain let me explain this explain it not explain explain it this is a basic business disagreement. Uh, Comcast had put other blacks on their network, as I said before. They just chose not to put his uh, program on their network for whatever reasons they had. He said it was discrimination. Okay, prove it. It's a, that's a racial discrimination suit between you and Comcast. Go fight it, and if you win, I'm sure there's people, who, who, uh, at, at, like in every company, who are backwards at Comcast, like their companies. People were backwards. People, I'm sure there's somebody backwards working at Operation Hope. I don't know about. If I know about them, they're gone. So you do business with people. Of course, there are backwards people everywhere. So, so, uh, so, so, um, if, if, if he can prove it, he should have fought, filed a, you know, a, a racial discrimination lawsuit. Takes this thing all the way to the Supreme Court, where all black folks can do is lose. Once you lose at the Supreme Court, there's a new precedent set, and the bar gets heightened for true civil rights. Uh, lawsuits. Who, who was, this was a civil rights case, and you know, this is not. Uh, you can see all of John's videos, about a 12 minute video on his uh, Facebook page. And so uh, he certainly uh, shared his thoughts there, saying, I told you so, <laughs> Reese, Erica. I know Greg had to yeah. go. So just final comments on this topic. Go ahead. Well, I mean, he raised the stakes and he basically screwed over Black America from what you know, what you all just presented. So shame on him. That's my final comment. <laughs> yeah, I think that this is um, very insightful. And then it also really kind of goes back to um, some of the commentary that we saw on social media um, just recently with um, when the uh, uh, um, when the Justice Policing Reform Act was rolled out and people were more enthralled with the Kente cloth than they were with the actual policy. So I think that this is really kind of um, another way to point us in the direction to uh, really kind of keep our eyes on the prize and to actually be more uh, of a student as it relates to what the issue is and um, not just really the, the shiny the shiny ball. Mm -hmm. All right, folks. Um, so we'll see what happens next. Uh, love to have Byron come back on the show, uh, but uh, hopefully uh, we'll do that. He did write that letter uh, a few days ago, uh, talked about laying out this 10-point plan in terms of what black America uh, should be demanding uh, in this, uh, in the wake of the George Floyd death. If you have not seen it, uh, be sure to check that out. <clears throat> All right, folks, we were playing the interview with Governor Phil Murphy with a technical malfunction. I think we have it fixed. So here's the rest of that interview. Who, who have lived the experience that people can relate to. But I'll give you an action that, that we have got to get to. So we've been like most every state, I guess, in America, remote learning since March. We were one of the states that closed down earliest. Um, we have, we've got tens of thousands of kids who live in families that don't have the ability or access to a device uh, to learn from home the way the other kids are learning. Uh, and we had to do a lot of workarounds for that. That's unacceptable. We shouldn't have to learn that lesson twice. Let's fix that. Let's make universal um, health care. We look at the fatalities from COVID-19. 
disproportionate impact on communities of color. The child inflammation syndrome, which is somewhat related, and thank God we've only got 39 cases. 30 of them, I think, are either black or Latino. What's, what are we doing about that? So I think it's embrace the moment. Uh, the words need to be right. Take the actions that you know we need to take criminal justice reform, access to jobs, housing, education, whatever it might be. And by the way, if we can if we can put more qualified folks in positions that could be there for folks to look up to and say, you know what, that, ex that person is like me, I've got an experience like theirs. Um, and, and, and I think we, we, can, we can't do enough of that right now. And um, the other thing that we're seeing is we're seeing, play, again, where Confederate statues are coming down. Uh, heck, over in Belgium, they're taking down the statues of uh, King Leopold. And, and I think what people are understanding is that symbols do matter. Uh, you, had, you had Donald Trump yesterday who's, who just refused to say, no, we're not going to change any of these uh, military bases. Um, what do you make of that and this whole attitude of, well, we shouldn't change American history when, last I checked, they lost. They were the traitors. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, amen. So it's, it, they may be statues and not human beings, but I think it's a similar, broadly speaking, similar reality to my comment a minute ago. We need more role models that reflect our communities. I think also the, 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 uh, the, the still life uh, forms also have to reflect the reality of our country, our diversity, uh, and whether you know it's a statue or the name of a building or a name of a base, I think we got. Yeah, you know, I'm with you. I think you got to. That stuff matters. I don't think we can. You know, symbols matter, and I think we have to make sure that we're thinking about our words, our actions, who our leaders are, and what symbols we choose to embrace or not embrace uh, at this moment in time. And it's not a moment too soon. Uh, I do want to talk about, um, of course, coronavirus' impact. Uh, you know, small businesses in your state not happy uh, with um, reopening. What's happening with that? Uh, how are you, you know, reopening your state as a result of what's happened with coronavirus? What's going on in New Jersey? Yeah, we've begun to reopen it, Roland. Uh, and some folks clearly, listen, there's some folks who want to go faster. And, and by the way, there are others who come to me more privately who say we're going too fast. We're making these decisions as best we can based on the data. So we've had uh, 12,400 and something fatalities. So we're the number two most hit state in America. And uh, not all, of them, every county in our states had fatalities, but the, the bulk of them have been in the New York City metro reality. It's been crushed. But we began now six to eight weeks ago, slowly but surely opening up. Uh, we're going to continue to open up. We're beginning phase two tomorrow with indoor faith, with restrictions, Monday outdoor dining, daycare, non-essential retail, the Monday after, uh, so, you know, hair salons, barber shops. I hope we'll get to inside stuff sooner than later. The data that we looks at, look at are principally rate of transmission, how many people are testing positive for it right now, new hospitalizations. Those are probably the three most important uh, data points and 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 we don't want to have to you know as I've said publicly and privately we've been through hell I don't want to go through it a second time uh, we got to make sure that we're not sort of lurching but that we are methodical about this systematic responsible we'll get there the indoor stuff I know you know this but the indoor stuff's harder the virus is a lot more lethal inside than it is outside and so indoor dining casinos banquet halls we'll get there but that's that's harder, that'll take a little bit longer. And how is New Jersey making sure your black businesses are being helped and assisted? Uh, because, uh, I mean, look, they're greatly, not only are we, the black folks greatly impacted by the coronavirus, but also when you talk about the lack of resources, lack of access to capital, uh, it's really a difficult time for black businesses. Amen. It was, be, it was, it was difficult in peacetime, never mind in the, these, these moments in the, in the pandemic. Uh, our Economic Development Authority by the way, I was proud to name four new uh, directors to our Economic Development Authority about six months ago, all of them women and with great diversity. Uh, the Economic Development Authority has explicitly, in the grants and loans that it's made, has explicitly and deliberately had a heavier emphasis on minority women and veteran-owned businesses. 
uh, and we'll continue to do that uh, both during the pandemic and as we start, we slowly recover. Last question. We saw what happened in Georgia. Huge mess with the elections. Uh, no. How are you going to ensure that in New Jersey things go smoothly in November if people are afraid to go to the polls? Was, uh, uh, yeah. Georgia was a mess. So what we've done is we moved our primary roll in from June 2nd to July 7th. And we said, listen, if you're a Democratic or a, a Democrat or a Republican and you're registered, you'll get a mail-in ballot. If you're unaffiliated, you have to actually request a ballot to go into either of the two primaries. But we also said that each county has to have at least 50 percent capacity of in-person voting on July 7, and each municipality has to have at least one polling location so that you, you have the choice then of mailing it in or showing up on the day of the election and voting. And we believe we have the right capacity and we, we believe we're balancing both the sacred right of democracy to vote, but to do it safely and without getting sick. Um, and so we're gonna learn a lot on July 7 and, and my guess is we'll apply a lot of what we learned on the 7th of July to what we're gonna need to do in November. Governor Phil Murphy in New Jersey. I appreciate it, sir. Thanks a lot. Great to see you, Roland. Thanks for having me. Thank you. All right, folks, real quick break. We come back. Crazy as white people. Next to Roland Martin Unfiltered. You want to support Roland Martin Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roland Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. So a lot of y'all always asking me about terms, some of the pocket squares that I wear. Now, I don't know. Robert don't have one on. Nope. Now, I don't particularly like the white pocket squares. I don't like even the silk ones. And so I was reading GQ magazine a number of years ago, and I saw uh, this guy who had this, this pocket square here, and it looks like a flower. Uh, this is called a shibori pocket square. This is how the Japanese manipulate the fabric to create this sort of flower effect. So I'm going to take it out and then place it in my hand so you see what it looks like. And I said, man, this is pretty cool. And so I tracked down, the. it took me a year to find a company that did it. Uh, and so uh, they make these about 47 different colors. And so I love them because, again, as men, we don't have many accessories to wear, so we don't have many, many options. Uh, and so this is really a pretty cool uh, pocket square. And what I love about this here is you saw uh, when it's uh, in, in the pocket, you know, it gives you that flower effect like that but if I wanted to also unlike other because if I flip it and turn it over it actually gives me a different type of texture and so therefore it gives me a different look so there you go so uh, if you actually want to uh, get one of these shibori pocket squares we have them in 47 different colors all you got to do is go to rollingthismartin.com forward slash pocket squares so it's rollingthismartin.com forward slash pocket squares. All you got to do is go to my website uh, and you can actually uh, get this. Now, for those of you who are members of our Bring the Funk fan club, there's a discount for you to get our pocket squares. That's why you also got to be a part of our Bring the Funk fan club. Uh, and so that's what we want you to do. And so it's pretty cool. So if you want to jazz your look up, you can do that. In addition, uh, y'all see me with some of the feather pocket squares. My sister who's a designer. She actually makes these. They're all custom made. So when you also go to the website, Site, you can also order one of the customized uh, feather pocket squares uh, right there at rollingsmartin.com forward slash pocket squares. So please do so. And of course, uh, it goes to support the show. And again, if you're a Bring the Funk fan club member, you get a discount. This is why you should join the fan club. No charcoal girls are allowed. Not a new oh, why? I got you, Carl. Uh, um, illegally selling water without a permit? On my property. On my property. Whoa! Hey! Hey, remember, give me your ass. You don't live here. I'm uncomfortable. All right, yesterday NASCAR announced you cannot fly your Confederate flag at any of their racetracks, not on the premises. White boy who drove in their truck series, Ray Cicciarelli, he posted that, uh, you know what, um, no more. He's not going to do any more of this here. Go to my, um, go to my, now get I'm trying to find this. I don't know if this is actually real or not, but 
He apparently tweeted, I'd like to announce I'm retiring from NASCAR after this season. I cannot drive a car for a league that won't allow my special flag. Now, again, I'm not, I don't know if this is true or not, but no, no, go back. NASCAR's response, we actually had to Google who you were. I'm sure your dozens of fans are real sad about your crusade to defend participation trophies. Might be made up, but hell, I love the shade, Racy. Hilarious. I mean, what kind of political statement are you making? You were a loser, I think, over 30 times. So, by Ashy, as Portia from the Rural Housewives of, of Atlanta would say, you will not be missed, boo. All right, y'all, the next one. Ohio State Senator Steve Huffman, who's also an emergency room physician, says that even though African Americans have a higher incidence of chronic conditions and it makes them more susceptible to death from COVID, there's another reason. Erica, in an interview, he said, quote, but why it doesn't make them more susceptible to just get COVID? Could it just be that African Americans or the colored population do not wash their hands as well as other groups or wear a mask or do not socially distance themselves? That could be the explanation of the higher incidents. Oh, they are in his ass. Other Republicans are like, did you just say colored, Eric? He did. Um, as many people still refer to the illustrious black population. But be very clear, he now has an opponent that's running um, for his seat in the state Senate. And so I would encourage people to look at that profile and support that sister. She's asking for at least $5 uh, to chip in. I, I cannot recall her name at the moment. First of all, hold on. Oh, look for her name right now. Look for her name uh, okay. so we can give it out to people. Because uh, okay. he, he a damn fool. He is a fool. But then, see, this is how we... Um, this is why race data is important when we're talking about COVID, right, um, how it disproportionately impacts us. And we see this all across healthcare systems. But then I think it's, you know, quite funny when we think about a population of folks who um, are new to washcloths, who don't use washcloths, who don't wash their <laughs> legs, to just throw <laughs> off and say that black people don't wash their hands. Child, please. But let me find this sister's name real quick. Oh, in Torrance, California, <laughs> this crazy-ass white woman is being nominated for Karen of the Year. <laughs> hey, listen to me. We don't play games here anymore, okay? The next time you ever talk to me like that, you're gonna get your ass kicked by my family. They're gonna fuck you up. What did That's I do? Right. They're gonna fuck you Why? up. What did I do? Because you are an asshole. Look at the whole stairs to yourself. But you had these Why stairs don't you and go somewhere stairs? else where you can go to a gym? This is not just for you. Oh, you get the to... fuck out of this world. Get the fuck out of this state. Go back to whatever fucking Asian country you belong in. Okay, you racist. You fucking bitch. This is not your place. This is not your home. We do not want you here. Ooh. You put that on Facebook. I hope you do. Because every fucking person will beat the crap out of you from here on out. Don't you ever say, oh, Jesus, to me when I want to use the stairs, you little bitch. There's other stairs. You are a sick fucking ignorant teenager. Oh, oh, thank wait, you. Fucking what, middle-aged woman? <laughs> Who wears black in California sun? Who the fuck wears black? Are you an idiot? You wear black in California sun? Where are you going? <laughs> <sighs> Richie, that woman was a little bit more calmer than my ass would have been with, with Karen <laughs> cussing me out like that. <laughs> They know... I, I've heard a statement, and I, I believe that white people started it, but it's uh, monkey know which tree to climb, and they know who to try and who not to try. Because I wouldn't have picked up the camera because I need to set up... You know how some people do? I won't say white folks, but you know how some people set up their pre-checks and their calls? It would have been all, don't hit me, don't attack me, and I would have been wearing her ass out. Listen... Oh. You can carry a phone or you can carry some mace. If you ain't got hands, guess what? Then you need to be walking around with some mace. And as soon as these folks come into your face, shh, shh, mace them all up in the face. Get them all out your space. It's a threat. She was all up in that woman's face with COVID-19. She ain't have no mask on. She was going off. Oh, no, it would have been some, uh, I don't want to say violence, but it would have been a different kind of exchange where she understood I'm not the one. Erica? <laughs> Um, this is my mace, and so I am very well trained. And I agree with Reese. I believe that those folks know or believe that they know who it is that they can run up on. Um, definitely mm -hmm, can't be mm -hmm. a sister. And we're starting to see this really as um, 
white people are beginning to lose their mind because they're understanding the power that they believe that they want held, the spell that, uh, that folks were under, under disbelief of their power, they're seeing that that is uh, going away. And they're seeing that um, that authority that protected them via, uh, via law enforcement is being challenged as well. So we'll continue to see more of these recorded incidents. But be very clear, you run up on the sister, especially this one with locks, uh, your mace <laughs> is going to feel real different. Absolutely. I certainly want to thank the two of you. Folks, show's not over, though. Tomorrow, June 12th on Netflix, Spike Lee's Vietnam-era film, The Five Bloods, debuts. It stars Dilroy Lindo, Clark Peters, Norm Sims, Isaiah Whitlock. It's a fabulous movie, and I had a chance to sit down with Clark Peters and chat with him about this amazing film. Watch this. All right, Clark Peters, man, glad to have you uh, with me. Let's talk about uh, The Five Bloods. Um, how intense was this? I can tell by watching it, y'all did a lot of sweating. <laughs> well, Roland, first of all, thank you for having me on here. Um, it's been a, a, a desire to be in your company and, and commune and talk with you for a long time. Um, but to your question, it was hot. Where um, a lot of times um, working under conditions that that those vets were working under, you know, 90 degrees. You know, it, it must have averaged about 100 degrees daily, whether we're in the bush or whether we're walking through a a, a, um, a rice paddy field um, or just on the in, in the in the arid land, you know, and then carrying all that stuff on top of it. It was it, it wasn't an easy gig. No, it wasn't. So, man, I'm telling you, it, 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 was just, it was just interesting just watching it because, again, uh, I was sitting there going, uh, especially, especially when uh, Spike chose not to use younger actors to play y'all younger. I bet y'all were like, why in the hell he got us out here running around with these guns, shooting these action scenes in his heat? <laughs> That's a good observation. <laughs> I can remember we did a boot camp for about two weeks prior to shooting where we had to be these ex-military men doing all that kind of stuff outside shooting, fanning to the right, left, getting down, getting up. I got two metal knees, you know. I can't be running around like that like I used to be, you know. But it served the purpose. It served the purpose for what it might feel like for a person who has PTSD, you know, that they are reliving... Uh, situations that are in the past that are traumatic and they have no control over that you know the situation remains the same but they have grown old well that was really um you know when when when, uh, when spike told me he was shooting this i mean obviously uh we were waiting to actually see what it looked like and, and, and he wanted to tell a story uh, he wanted to do a story about the black experience uh, of uh, soldiers during d during Vietnam. Uh, and um, I mean, I think a lot of people really, really, really will get an understanding on the reality of that PTSD, uh, of the pain and the trauma that troops had to endure there then also coming back. Yes, yes. I hope so, because, you know, I'm... As a teenager, I was against all of that. Uh, as an adult, um, I appreciate I appreciate what these men do, and having <laughs> and having been stuck out there, not being shot at, you know, uh, I have to take a hat to them, you know, and for them to be treated the way that they're being treated in, uh, uh, all across the world, veterans are just citizens. And, you know, it's a crying shame. You know, I have a friend in, in, in Baltimore who said to me, they teach you how to do all these atrocious things, but when you come on back, they don't teach you how to, they don't unteach you how to do all of this stuff. It becomes so much a part of you, you know, and you're, you're a broken person, you know. So that moment when, when Otis and Paul are talking to each other, you know, it's about being able to talk with love, to each other, to be supportive of each other in that shared in that shared trauma, which being a mediator 
uh, uh, um, with, with your pain, really. Otherwise, I can't see that not overwhelming a human being. I cannot see that, you know, it's like we, we, if we are still suffering the effects of slavery 400 years later, Imagine a person who's been trained to go out and kill some men, women, children, and see that and have your best friends dying right there to you. What does that leave you with? One of the things that um, really shone through um, the film is the idea of brotherhood, that, that you really, really and truly um, are brothers out there and that experience um, locks in a lifetime of brotherhood yes all of you are actors um but what did you do off air to establish that level of camaraderie where you wanted people to feel that brotherhood uh when watching the film well First of all, we were five black men in a foreign country. <laughs> you know, we would dine with each other. We would, uh, we would hang out with each other. We would go on tours with each other. We would talk uh, about the, uh, the script. We would talk about black history. Um, and men of a certain generation, um, naturally find a love or a bond, you know. I'd worked with Isaiah before, and we've always had a wonderful and good time, so it was easy to love that brother, you know. Um, Delroy was someone who I'd seen throughout my career, always wanted to work with, and I and I love his work. So it was a joy just being with him, you know. Um, uh, for Norm, we've done, we both come out of theater, We've done the same roles on both sides of the ocean, you know, so it was a joy there. So the love, you know, and, and the bonding um, was easy off stage, you know, off camera. So it couldn't help. And, and it was a blessing that we were able to take it on to the camera. You know, it was it was easy. That, that was a given. We love each other, you know, and we hope that we hope that is something that will be picked up by other people to understand, you know, when we love each other, can nothing stop us? One of the things that I thought was was, was quite interesting when we talk about that idea of brotherhood, uh, that is, any time, any time that, that there was an issue and there was dissension, uh, there was disagreement, you all forced one another to come back to the point of brotherhood. And by essentially saying, look, this is a circle of one. We're not gonna allow the cir circumstance. And so uh, the placing of the hands um, in, in the center where you all had to touch and agree. I, I think back to the same scene in the five heartbeats, uh, yep. same thing. And so it, 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 it really spoke loudly that no matter what we go through, we're pissed off with each other, angry with each other, at the end, we've got to come back to that point of setting it all aside because we're still brothers. And your point, your point, is it, is it that, that um, um, it's something that needs to be brought back into the, into, the, into the community, into the fold. I imagine that there was a time when uh, people migrated from the north, from the south to the north, um, and whether they knew each other, what they had in common was the struggle. And so they were able to help each other through the new struggle. Um, as a generation who doesn't recognize what we went through in the 60s to bring about, you know, the 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 voting, uh, the voting uh, rights or the or the, uh, um, the anti-segregation bills and all of this, you know, uh, it's not been in that situation. I can see that it's hard for one to understand how this can be or recognize the power in it. You know, um, 
but it's a necessary thing for all of us to get back to. It's a thing all men, all men of color have got to get back to because we are divided. And if we, are, if we remain divided, we will be conquered. There is no doubt about that. I got no doubts, you know. But as long as, long as you keep these, as long as cats like you keep this conversation going, right, there's hope. Well, that's one. Look, we, we absolutely will, will definitely keep the conversation going because, again, as as you know, the reason the brotherhood aspect resonated with me, uh, I'm a life member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, and we have what I actually call brotherhoods uh, where we is where we look women, wives, girlfriends. No one is invited. Uh, you know, um, we shut everybody off. And man, we might we might be in that brotherhood for five, six, eight, ten hours, and some of the most deeply personal things come out in that. And it was all it's all about uh, connecting with one another and realize that we have something in common, and that uh, even if we don't see each other for a long time, that brotherhood uh, still exists. And and, and I, I just think that that really spoke loudly watching watching this film uh and just looking at the interaction um and even at, at, at times when the other men didn't know what was going on in a brother's life once they found out you can see they felt the collective pain for that brother yes yes you know there's you know what what, what we tend to uh not want to do is share our vulnerabilities um, with each other. Um, and when we do share our vulnerabilities with each other, it gives the listener of our vulnerabilities a chance to exercise their strength. It gives them a chance to exercise their compassion. So it's necessary, as you saw with this, you know, when, when um, with Paul and Otis, Otis talking about, uh, Paul talking about his PTSD. Otis saying, you gotta talk to somebody about that. I invite you to come along and sit with us. If we don't go through that type of fire, if we don't sit in the crucible with other brothers going through this motion, then, then we won't, we're not galvanized within ourselves, you know? where uh, uh, you, you, you're still a bit of soft clay, you know? You haven't been, uh, uh, um, what's the word? You haven't, what's the word, huh? What's the word? <laughs> you haven't been Baptized. fortified, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. So I got to ask you this here. Uh, you talked about working with Isaiah before. That dude is absolutely hilarious. I mean, so even though this is a drama, it is intense. Uh, he just delivers some of the funniest lines in, uh, in this movie. I just—he had to have y'all cracking up on the set. More often not. <laughs> there's, there's a there's one scene where some of his lines were taken on out because it was just too funny. I mean, he was just. <laughs> I love Isaiah because when, when we when we were in Baltimore together, he would travel around Baltimore on a bicycle. And I'd say, hey, Holmes, you know, why don't you get a car, you know? And he said, Clark, you know, it's the way I like to get down. But, like, you make me embarrassed every time, I say, every time you see me with the bicycle. Well, <laughs> after, at the end of one season, I was in New York. <laughs> and I saw him coming up 8th Avenue on his bicycle and he tried to hide <laughs> and all we could do is laugh <laughs> all we could do is laugh about this you know you know i got a lot of time for isaiah i really 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 do you know and he's one of our theater brothers you know so uh yeah we got a lot we, we got a lot to mess around with Obviously, um, when when we examine um, the, the various relationships, um, I really, I, I really was, I really was surprised watching it 
to see the inclusion of the son of Dilroy Lindo because it was it was it was sort of like as I, when I watched the movie and I'm I'm thinking it's 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 the four of you going back then all of a sudden that character is brought in I I, I thought that was that was a really interesting thing because it brought the next generation to to come to come to to to, to come full frontal with what that previous generation had to endure and for him to actually see what that pain was like for his father that he never really understood i thought that was a very interesting twist that was used i hope that i hope that uh, um that uh, some young bloods who are, who see that um come to the same conclusion as you, Roland. Um, it's one thing to, 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 um, to see the vets out there on the street, you know, with a sign across them saying homeless or, you know, or off on drugs. But it's another thing to walk in their shoes and understand how they got in that condition. And until, uh, um, in this respect, until... Uh, uh, some young men really take a look at it. And this is almost redundant for, for black Americans because we're, we are constantly in war anyway, daily. So, um, and if you think you're not, then you gotta, you gotta, you gotta rethink your, 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 your position. Um, but it, for us as well, it was, it was great to have young blood there so that we could as well sh express our need to nurture and to look after him as well. Because he might have been uh, Paul's son, but he was all of our nephews. You dig what I'm saying? You know, it was necessary mm -hmm. to, to find a way to, uh, uh, to keep him in the fold, you know, and also not give him an easy pass. You know, you don't get no easy passes. You follow what we're going to say, and then no questions about it. Otherwise, we'll throw your <laughs> ass off of that, <laughs> off that back. And I keep saying, well, one of y'all are coming with us. That made us think, well, well, that might be true, you know. But, you know, that that's, that's kind of how it went down. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, I mean, I, I just, I, you know, again, I, I, it's, it's one of those things that, um, look, I mean, I, I, I watch a lot of movies. Um and what was also great, which frankly we do not see a lot of, we don't see a lot of films of older black men being able to show and go from love, brotherhood, vulnerability. Uh, and we've seen movies with younger brothers. I think back uh, to Juice uh, and others. But it was also great to see uh, black men operating in a space where it was really just them. Now, yes, you had, you, you had uh, other characters who came in the play, but this is really a movie that speaks to this 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 space where it was just black men dealing with one another. Yes, yes. Black men dealing with each other uh, um, in, an, in, in a situation that was only theirs, you know, a situation that isn't shared with, or that, that, that is unique, you know. Black men going back to, to, uh, to find their fallen brother that alone, that alone is, uh, uh, is, is a valuable uh, um, lesson uh, uh, and a wonderful story, you know, that should plant the seeds of, of compassion and need to nurture, hopefully, in some youngsters. I can remember looking at these films when I was when I was when I was a kid, you know, Saturday afternoon, you know, you'd always get something, some old black and white film that turned out to be a propaganda film, you know, but there were elements of it that made you feel heroic, that you wanted to be the hero. You know, I got a chance to play in one of those films and it's called The Five Bloods. 
and it had nothing to do with anyone else except us trying to look after each other and mm -hmm. care of each other and love each other. I think that that's what that's 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 what uh, it's that love. I think anything else that is prominent in this in this piece. I think that's what what will what people will carry away with them. You know, speaking with some of the young sisters that I was I've been doing interviews with, that's what they are taking away with from uh, from it. You know, that's what they've got from this. You know, I wasn't too sure, and I'm still not too sure of exactly how the rest of the uh, of the world is going to take it. In light of everything that's going on now, in light mm -hmm. of all that, with this uh, history lesson that you're also getting, um, you're getting more than you bargained for for your money, whether you know it or not. I do have to ask you this here. Um, the character you played in Love Is. Uh-huh. Um, I, 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 first of all, uh, I, I love the show. Uh, love Mar Brock Akil, uh, Salim Akil. But, but what I really appreciated about it is that what you really showed, and again, it's just what you, you're not seeing a lot. We're seeing it more now. Because we're seeing, because of streaming services, because of, um, you know, more opportunities, we're actually seeing it. But really, this uh, sense of humanity uh, and deep, deep uh, love that that character was able to exhibit. Um, and it wasn't about being macho. It was about being vulnerable at times. Um, and I just really thought... What, what you did with that character was really great. And, and, I, and I've told Mara, I said, I, I really, really hope um, she is able to bring that show back because I, I just thought it was just an amazing thing to watch, to watch black love, pain, agony, ecstasy every single week. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, um, over here, um I remember walking through uh, one of the grocery stores and I'm being followed by this young sister, you know, and she stops me. She says, hey, excuse me, excuse me, love. Are you that bloke that's on that love is thing? <laughs> I said, yes. Yeah. You know, I'm, uh, it's the best thing that she'd ever seen, you know. When we get a chance to express, again, uh, I guess sometimes we just need to be shown how to love, you know? But one thing I do know about love is that if you stay in it, if you stay in it, it really can take care of everything, you know? But I love about, uh, about, uh, uh, um, about that show was that this was a couple that was going through all sorts of stuff. And he took the time to remember where their center was, which was that pillar of love. They were able to overcome some stuff. I felt that also, and this is, you know, this, my, I might be speaking out of turn here, but I think, I, need, I think it needs to be said, is that a brilliant opportunity was missed when all the nonsense went down with that. Because had they kept the the, the uh, cameras rolling and the people writing, we would have been able to see that love in the in work in real time, in real time, in a real situation. And should and it shouldn't have been pulled off because of what it was pulled off for. But we should have stood up and challenged it with the same things that we were doing on that uh, uh, on that show. Yeah, yeah. I agree. More I agree. Of that. More of I that. Agree. More of that. We I, can't be afraid I, of this stuff. You know, we can't be afraid of it. And there's nothing soft about about loving. You know, you try that. You try that, man. It, it's hard. It's hard sometimes to forgive somebody and to be in the same room with them. It's hard as hell. But if you stay there and you stick with it, you find you find yourself elevated by the experience. You know. And sometimes I think that there's a conspiracy against us to love ourselves because of the power of it. Because it's easier 
it's almost easier to 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 smack somebody upside the head rather than sit back and argue, debate, try to understand another person's side. There was a time when we used to fight. Nowadays, when stuff goes wrong, you just eliminate the problem. What kind of nonsense is that? That don't make no sense to me mm -hmm. whatsoever. But somewhere in the space of love and what love is about, there's a healing that takes place. Whatever that energy is, you know, whatever it is, mamas can pick you up off the floor with a broken arm and hold you, and her love is that arm feel good, you know? A man can go out and have an affair. A woman can go out and have an affair and completely screw up everything. But if their partner says, listen, you know, I tr I'm going to try to understand what's going on here. I'm going to give you a little bit of the benefit of a doubt. I guarantee you, I guarantee you that they'll be in court tomorrow. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, again, I, I just, I just, I just wanted to tell you, uh, thank you for for how you played that role. Uh, I just really uh, think that uh, it, 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 it is, it is, it's important for black men to see characters like that um, that represents uh, a level of manhood that we often don't see. Uh, and, and, and so, the, and so I, I just thought that that was just, just really important. And, I, and I've expressed that uh, to Mara and Salim as well, that, uh, that really, again, I really think story, stories like that are vital because unfortunately, and just like stories like what we see in The Five Bloods is vital, is because we don't see enough of black men showing that love, care, affection for one another that and, and and this is and again and I want sisters to understand, just like when I talk about being in my fraternity, there are places that women cannot and should not be when it comes to black men. Just yes. like there are places that black women need to be at amongst black women. And I just think seeing that also speaks to brothers and say it's okay to love your fellow brother. Uh, and and be able to express uh, what you're going through, if it's pain, if it's joy, no matter what it is. Absolutely. You know, and the more that we see that, the more that we will give examples to youngsters and the right to go ahead and do that for themselves. You know, rather than taking rather than taking the the easy way out. You know, and you're right. We have to do it for ourselves. Men have got to do it for men. Women have got to do it for women. There's a place where only we can, we can communicate with each other. Only we can communicate with each other. It's a place where we can nurture each other to stay in whatever that relationship is and to weather whatever problems you and your partner are going through. We need that ourselves. And the more that we find a place to lodge that respect, you know, the, uh, the, stronger, we, the stronger we will be. You know, it's... This ain't Ozzy and Harriet time. <laughs> this ain't leave it to beaver <laughs> nonsense. You know what I'm saying? You know, all that stuff that were given to us in the 50s and the 60s on, on how your family should, should function, you know, and father knows best. Some fathers don't know shit. Excuse my language. You know, sometimes he You're don't know. Good. Sometimes mama knows a lot more. You know what I'm saying? You get me riled up Absolutely. here. Absolutely. <laughs> well, you know, uh, again, uh, I try not to ask the traditional Hollywood questions when it comes to movies. Uh, and so uh, so we, we do a little bit different of uh, my show. Uh, Clark Peters, uh, it, it has been absolute fabulous chatting with you. Uh, hopefully uh, our paths will get to cross one day uh, and then I'll get to uh, uh, give you one of those brotherhood embraces. Amen. I look forward to that, Roland. And you keep on doing what you're doing, man, because... You are my, my mainstay when I'm not in America. You know, you keep me in touch with what's going on. I love the conversations that you guys have, the debates, and that Candice Owen, whatever her name is. Yeah, you stay on that girl's butt. You understand? Don't let her up. <laughs> do not let her up. That's absolutely Will do. nothing. More power to you, bro. Will do. All right, brother, you take care. And you. Peace.
Peace. The Five Bloods tomorrow opens on Netflix. All right, folks, got to go. Real quick shout out. Yesterday was a 53rd wedding anniversary of my parents, Reginald and Imelda Martin. Uh, so I want to give them a shout out. Today, 20th anniversary of my brother, uh, Reginald, and his wife, Miranda. So I want to give them a shout out before we go. All right, folks, don't forget, if you want to support Roller Martin Unfiltered, please uh, go to our cash app, dollar sign RM Unfiltered. You can also go to our PayPal, paypal.me forward slash rmartinunfiltered. Venmo is venmo.com forward slash RM Unfiltered. Don't forget, if you want to send a cashier's check, money order, all you got to do is send to New Vision Media Inc. That's our parent company. Make the check out to that name, New Vision Media Inc., new in you. 1625 K Street, Northwest, Suite 400, Washington, D.C., 20006. That's how you can hook us up. So, all right, folks, I appreciate it. Uh, by the way, uh, Raynard, all that trash he talked yesterday at the White House, so he couldn't do the show today, but they finally called. So he's going to be here Monday at 7 p.m. You better get some rest this weekend, because it's going to be rough for you on Monday, Raynard. I'll see you all tomorrow. <laughs>